So you have to be both totally centered in your own self-confidence and also you have to keep your ears open and eyes open and be willing to take the cues and hints from the world around you. Hello, and welcome to the Millennial Mastermind Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Mulvey. If you're a millennial looking for actionable advice and a proven formula on how to build the life of your dreams, then this is the show for you. Each week, I'll be connecting with inspiring guests who will be sharing their wisdom on how to reach success. So if you're ready to take your life to the next level, buckle up and enjoy the ride. Bonjour, ladies and gents, and welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in today. I'm thrilled to introduce you to today's guest as his work has had a direct impact on my own journey of personal development, which actually ultimately led to the founding of this podcast and my own entrepreneurial ambitions. Today's guest is John David Mann. John has been a concert cellist an award-winning composer, high school founder, educator, publisher, entrepreneur, marketer, public speaker, and even event master of ceremonies. John has co-authored two dozen books, including seven New York Times and national bestsellers. His books have sold more than two million copies, including the best-selling classic, The Go-Giver, with co-author Bob Berg, who, if some of you have been listening to this show for a long time, might remember that he was one of my first guests ever way back on episode number five. Now I believe this is episode number 75. Uh, and his latest book is coming up this fall and is self his self-published culinary parable, The Recipe, A Story of Loss, Love, and the Ingredients of Greatness. John, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. I'm exhausted listening to that introduction. Oh my god! I know. I, I and a lot of times what I'll do is I'll have a a guest come on and give their background, and I thought yeah. that would be the entire show because you've done so many amazing things <laughs> that uh, I would work through that one. But uh, is there anything I missed there, uh, or is that a pretty all encompassing look at it? Um, I discovered the North American continent. Uh, no, I don't think you missed anything. Uh, uh, if you did, I don't know what it was. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Well, then we can dive right into it um, yeah, because I'm super excited to talk about uh, your journey. Um, and, and I mentioned there in the intro that your work had, has had a direct impact on my journey. And I was referencing uh, you and John or you and Bob Berg's book, The Go Giver, talked about that that parable plenty in episode number five. So guests can go back and listen to that one for a background, but I'm Fantastic. a huge fan of that book and that series. And it really started me kind of on this journey of personal development and self optimization, as I like to call it. So thank you for that contribution to the world. Oh man, you are so welcome. That's just, that's just gratifying to hear. Thank you. Um, but to get into into some of the other amazing stuff you've done. Obviously, from that intro, it's pretty apparent that you've had a very epic career and you've done quite a bit and made a large impact in this world. Um, so how do you choose which projects to embark on? Because if you just look at it on the paper there, it seems like it's kind of all over the place and you've accomplished so much in a variety of different areas. You know, at the time, it felt like I was all over the place and accomplishing nothing in any area. Uh, so, uh, it, it's, it, it is uh, a pretty wild map, and it, 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 it didn't, most of it did not feel very strategic at the time. Um, I, I'm starting to feel a little more strategic about where I'm directing my career, I think, at this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but a lot of, honestly, a lot of that, Brad, was just, was kind of, uh, circumstance, opportunity, and my interests and passions just kind of, you know, either pulling me somewhere or, or finding that I've fallen into something. I mean, my first entrepreneurial venture, I guess, really was starting that high school when I was a high school student myself. And I didn't know what being an entrepreneur was, but that's, that's, that was, I think, my seminal entrepreneurial experience. And it's in a way been a kind of a touchstone for me. Um, the rest of my life, although I suppose being a composer was kind of entrepreneurial uh, in its own way as well. 
But, you know, I, I, I never said, okay, I think I've had enough of doing this. I think it's time to do that. It, it just kind of seemed to, to fall out that way. As I said, these days, a little different. You know, I've, I, I've gotten to a point where I, I really will look at things and say, okay, now, what's the next chapter I want to open up? You know, you mentioned that this book is self-published, which is uh, something I did not expect to be doing. And it is, in a sense, stepping into a whole nother career or at least aspect of a career. So it's like, oh, my God, there he goes again, doing something different that he's not prepared for. Um, but this this one is, is, I'm happy to say, a little more strategic in that I actually did think before I jumped. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love to hear you say that, too, because I think that especially with young people and people who may just be starting off, um, whether it's in their career and they're thinking about starting something entrepreneurial or they're already in that entrepreneurial journey, there's seems to be uh, so many shiny objects to go after. Yes. And and sometimes, and I know that I face this myself, it's like, what do I start with? Where do, where do I get going? Like, what is that big thing that's going to propel my life into that next level of success? And you feel like you have to pick, you know, that one perfect, correct path for you. Yes. But based on your journey and what you're saying, it almost sounds like that that wasn't quite the case for you. You, you had a one path that led to another path that led to another path that it was all the dots were connected, but you couldn't look forward and see that big picture. But now looking back, you can see it. Yeah, it, it is one of the things that looks like it makes sense when you look at it backwards. Um, there were definitely pathways that opened up to me at certain points that I chose not to go down. I mean, mm -hmm. there were career opportunities that, uh, again, in retrospect, and even at the time, looked like they might have been really a smart thing to do, really either really lucrative or really, um, you know, have a lot of security attached or what have you, um, that I chose not to do. And I don't regret any of them uh, because things are, the way things fall out is so often so full of surprise. I, I like to say Bob Berg ruined my career. <laughs> how and, so? And how that happened was this. Um, it was 2003, 2004, in, in those early years of this, of, of this century, uh, my plan was to become a screenwriter. I was all set to go to Hollywood, write, write films. Um, I studied the, the craft. I'd written some scripts. I'd, you know, I, really, I poured my entrepreneurial self into it, and it really was, was going that direction. Man, that's what I was going to do. I was going to Hollywood. And Bob called and said he wanted to know if I would write this book with him. And, and it's like, I didn't have time. It was a distraction. It was uh, an annoyance. It's like, oh, man, I, I'm sorry. I don't have time to do this little parable project thing that you want to do. But as I told my wife, this is Bob. It's like, I love Bob. You know, uh, uh, and because it's Bob, I really kind of need to, to, to listen and take a look at it. Um, and that was the go-giver. Uh, I, I never did go to Hollywood, which I'm actually kind of glad about. I think Hollywood would have, would have chewed me up and spat me out probably. <laughs> it is a tough career path. But you know, a lot of my life has been that way. When I look at the things that have been the most momentous, significant, important, and positive developments in my life, I don't think there was a single one of them that came about as a result of my plan. I'm not, and I'm not saying planning isn't good because I think planning is critical but I think that it's the ingredient, the recipe is pl planning plus being open to uh, the wisdom of circumstance, which often has uh, better ideas than we have for mm. ourselves. Yeah, that's really interesting. And so some of those opportunities that you turned down that at the time looked like they were lucrative and had high rates of security or, or anything like that. What were your reasonings for turning it down, or how, how did you decide not to pursue some of those opportunities? Was there any decision-making tool that you utilized, or how did yes. you look at that? Early in my life, you know, one example was uh, to teach at a university. I had a couple of, couple of opportunities um, that would have led to a, a path of teaching composition at, at universities. My, uh, my dad was a university professor, a musicologist, practicing choral conductor, really an uh, excellent top-level choral conductor. I played um, in in his ensembles a number of times. And, and so I, that was kind of the world that I came from in terms of my family of origin. And as a young composer, which was my first career path, um, 
you know, securing a position at a university was really a smart thing to do because it would have meant all kinds of security, you know, a way to have a steady income, which as a composer isn't easy to achieve unless you're a really successful film composer, maybe, mm. which wasn't. And uh, I didn't, the decision making process was, I just didn't feel like it. <laughs> I just, it wasn't where my passion lay. I couldn't see myself working in an academic context at a university position. I, and, you know, part of the problem is, I've really never been employable. Uh, I've, I've worked at a bookstore as a clerk for a few months when I was in my early 20s. And, I work, and I've worked a number of times as a teacher at, at educational institutions for, you know, one session. Um, I'm a lousy employee. I, I'm just, I'm not good at it. I don't like it. I like to work in my house for myself and, you know, un, within circumstances that are, that are to some extent under my own control. Yeah, I think that probably sounds pretty attractive to a lot of the listeners right now. So <laughs> preach into the that, choir. Yeah, yeah, I think they'll be soaking up this interview. Um, so this, you mentioned that this was the first of your books that you self-published. What was the reasoning for going down that route versus the the more traditional publishing route that you have for your others? Well, again, this is this is really something that that was brought to me by circumstance more than by choice at at first. Um, I mean, I've still published a few things in the past, but in both cases, they were not publications that I had big aspirations for. I didn't have any intention of selling more a couple mm. thousand or just, I wanted to make them available basically. So I, I knew, I, I knew the mechanical process. I also have had a background as, as a book designer, layout artist, book designer, jacket designer. So I, I know how to physically produce a book at a professional level of quality. So that, you know, I, I sort of knew that. Um, but being able to, to, you know, to whittle a statue doesn't mean you're going to run a successful art gallery. Um, so at this point, I, I had published two dozen books or so. As you said, New York Times bestsellers, et cetera. And, and I fully expected that this book would go, ma- would go the mainstream route. My, uh, when my, my uh, agent, my literary agent, who I'd had since, since the beginning with The Go-Giver, um, she looked at the manuscript. She called me back just about screaming. She said, this is the best writing you've ever done. This is, she, she said, this is incredible. We're going to take it to New York. There's going to be an auction, which means that, you know, a lot of publishers are going to vie for it. They're going to all try to top the other bid, the other one's bid. And, and it's going to be a seven figure advance. She said, this thing is just going to go, this is going to be like your, your big breakout moment, you know, mm-hmm. even bigger than the go-giver. None of that happened. <laughs> <laughs> she, she took it to New York, over 40 publishers looked at it and you know most of them liked it a few of them just don't like any parables so they said i'm sorry i just don't read parables i hate them um uh, they would have hated the go-giver and but most of them liked it a good number of them loved it raved over it some of them sent back emails that i would be proud to put on the back of the finished book as endorsements and they passed everyone Hmm. now when we took the go-giver to new york a decade ago um and it was over a decade ago, hard to believe. We got 21 rejections. And the 22nd said yes. Adrian Zakheim at Portfolio. And he's still with us today. He's a fantastic publisher. And the book has sold you know, almost a million copies. So all the, uh, all the other 21 are probably going, ah, curse you, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> so this was the same story, but there was no Adrian at the end of the story. We, we, there was f- over 40 rejections and nobody said yes. And what they all said was either... It's we, the book just doesn't fit our catalog. It's not in our category. It's not really a business book. It's not really a management book. Um, it's not. It, it just didn't fit. And they, in fact, they a lot of them said we don't see the bookshelf. We don't see which bookshelf at Barnes and Noble this book's going to sit on. We can't really figure out how to how to classify it. Hmm. So very regretfully, we've got to pass. So my my co-author, Chef Charles Carroll, and I, uh, Charles and I, really thought long and hard about it. Um, First of all, we, we had two two big issues before we even make this jump. Number one, are they right? All these editors, um, you know, is this book not going to work because it doesn't fit a category? And and number two, uh, do we really want to do this self publishing thing? Um, in terms of the categories, here's what we came to. You know, we listened carefully because these guys are not stupid. These editors, they're the opposite of that. There's a reason that they're in business. They're smart. They know what they're doing. They know the field. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they were right about this. 
or it doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily mean there's not, you know, there's not a place for this. What we we, we decided was the book. Uh, I know a lot of people who are really into personal development and leadership and that whole area, and who are also really into food. <laughs> who are foodies. <laughs> and this book is is the intersection of personal development and food. It's it's all about personal growth and the ingredients of greatness, as you said, but it all takes place in a diner kitchen, most of it. And so there's a lot of cooking. There's a lot of food lessons. There's a lot of uh, teaching from a, a master chef in, in the store. So it, it's the intersection of food and personal development. We believed and believe right now that there is that that market is there. Now, maybe nobody's identified that market before. Maybe a book like this has never been done, but we do believe that there's a market for that. The second question is, can we reach that market through self-publishing? Um, and that's really a challenge because we're both co- very busy with our full-time careers already. Charles running food for one of the busiest country clubs in the nation and, and me working on manuscripts for other books that I have deadlines for that keep me completely busy. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had to uh, think hard. You know, We don't have really the time. We don't have a budget. We don't really have the expertise. Uh, we decided to do it anyway. So that's uh, we jumped. We have pulled the trigger. We're doing it. <laughs> that's how it came about. That's awesome. Well, it's, it's an incredible kind of story of perseverance there. And you talked about the intersection of personal development and food. And those are literally two of my favorite things. <laughs> so there you go. Not, I just that. I, yeah, I cannot wait <laughs> to give it a read because I'm excited just thinking about it. Um, but so you, you mentioned you, you decided to go for it. Neither of you really had the expertise. You didn't have the time, the budget. Where do you go from there? Um, once you would sit down and you really say, you know what, this is it. We're going to do it. Forget what yeah. these other publishers are saying. We think that this is, this is the book that the world needs right now. Where do you go from there? So I don't want to exaggerate. When I say neither of us have the expertise, we've both – in our own way, been you know rubbed up against the expertise. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, I've I've been in the book world for a long time. My my normal business. Just to be clear about this, here's my business model. My my normal business model. Um, almost every book I've ever written has been co-authorship. I write it with somebody else. It's it's like it's like founding a business with a partner. It's like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Um, and and um, the way that works typically is we go in as 50-50 partners in the business, equal risk, equal reward. And um, I write the book, the other guy markets the book. That's our deal. So with The Go-Giver, now The Go-Giver itself is really, it's equal parts Bob Berg and, and John Mann, but there's a lot of both of us in it. It's just like, you know, how you are a combination of your parents. That book is like that of us. Mm-hmm. We're the parents of that thing. But as a business model, uh, basically, I, the, the lion's share of the writing was, was up to me. The lion's share of the promotion and marketing is up to Bob. That's kind of how – that's our division of labor. And that's how I am with Brandon Webb, my Navy SEAL sniper buddy. That's how I am with Dan Burris. That's how I am with all, all the people I've written with. Basically, I write the book. They sell the book. Got it. So I, I, it's never been something that's been my forte, but I've, I've been – near it you know i've watched what bob mm-hmm. does <laughs> i've i've participated in it minorly now chef charles uh, chef charles has published two books before really for the culinary world but so he's he's been out there speaking some not hugely he's not a you know hugely famous celebrity chef like bobby flay or somebody um but he is a widely respected chef in the culinary world so it's like he has a lot of people who know him i have a lot of people that i know but Neither of us have ever really developed that as an author platform ourselves. So it's kind of like we were, we were on the outside looking into a world that we were somewhat familiar with. So you ask, where, where do you go first? My, I think the first place was making the decision, who do you listen to? Um, who, who am I going to – who are going to be our experts? Um, if you – and I think this could apply to any entrepreneurial field – if, if you go and look for a book on Amazon on how to publish, how to self-publish, or how to market and promote and sell your own book, oh, man, like you'll find 5,000 titles. There's so many books out right. there on this. And you know what? 97% of them, and I say this with, say this with, with love in my heart, 97% don't know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. I mean, or there may be some good advice mixed in with some really bad advice. 
there, there's a whole cottage industry that's sprung up since the internet has made available the tools to self-publish you know, fairly readily. There's this whole cottage industry of people who will partner with you to self-publish your book, which to me is an oxymoron. I mean, you'll <laughs> self-publish my book. Right. Not, you're, you're not myself. But anyway, they'll say, you know, give me $5,000 or give me $20,000 or whatever it is, and we'll edit and, and design a cover and we'll proofread and we'll print and we'll distribute and, you know, all for you. Turnkey operations. I don't trust them. Mm -hmm. I know there are probably some good ones. And I know that, that most of them probably have, you know, mixed reviews of some good features, some less good. I, I just, it's not what I wanted to do. Um, so the first real question was, who do you trust? Who do you listen to? Who do you hire as your experts? Right. And I, I sifted through the books and I didn't have a lot of time. It's, it's as much of a time as it is an effectiveness question. So I, uh, I found the book recommended to me first by Bob Berg. I, I got this one book that I decided this will be my Bible. I won't do everything he says exactly to the letter, but most of it. I'm going to try to follow what he, what he says as much as possible with my limited time. Um, that book is called Book Launch Blueprint by Tim Grahl, G-R-A-H-L. Brilliant. And the guy's got a track record. And, and he himself has a whole approach that is very economical. It's like doesn't try to do a million things. He tells you to do three things and do them really well. Um, so I grabbed Tim's book. And I leaned on advice from several writers I know who have a lot more experience self-publishing than I do. And I found one consultant that I would hire. Um, for 300 bucks, I got to talk for one hour on the phone with Jane Friedman, one of the best in the business. And she's been very generous uh, uh, with follow-up email afterwards. And what she did was I spent a lot of time formulating my questions. She kind of cut my learning curve from months down to a few days hmm. by answering a lot of questions that I just, I, I could have spent months researching in the internet because you'll hear a thousand voices saying contradictory things. Right. Um, she helped me f understand which paths were worth pursuing, which paths were not maybe worth pursuing. Um, for, here's, a, here's a path I chose not to pursue, for example. We're not going to try to get this book into bookstores or airport bookstores. Now, there's a way to do it. I could, if I spent the money and the time and the effort, I could probably get our book into airport bookstores or I could have a good stab at it. Not even going to waste a moment trying. Hmm. And I'd, I'd love it. I've had books in airport bookstores. It's a great place to put your books because you get a really high quality customer going through looking at that um, with a very keenly centered focus. And, eh, not going to do it. Forget about it. Um, the book's going to be out in a beautiful, high-quality hardcover. To look at it, it's indistinguishable from a mainstream published book. Um, it'll be out in, in uh, ebook and all the ebook channels, Kobo, everything. It's going to be out in audiobook, high-quality produced audiobook and all the audiobook channels. But we're not, it's not going to be in the shelves of Barnes & Noble because it would be way too much time, effort, money, difficulty for a self-publisher to get that done. So I, it was a lot of a lot of triage in the beginning. Hmm. So that I, I think that's really interesting because I think that th a lot of people across different industries, as you mentioned, face probably a similar issue of who do you listen to? Because yeah. self publishing is a great example, but anything that you're trying to do, there's going to be you know every there's going to be five thousand books on it. There's going to be so many different voices out there. Uh, YouTube channels, whatever podcasts, whatever yeah. it is, there's yeah. going to be so much advice. So I like that. So how did you, was it solely based on those recommendations that you landed, you know, on that one book, the book launch blueprint and leaning on and finding that consultant or were there other ways that you made that decision to go with just those limited, um, resources based, it was based on the recommendation of people I know and trust that I've known for a long time and trust well, um, combined with a very limited cursory amount of research on my <laughs> part. Uh, like I bought a couple books on how to self-publish and promote your own books, and I, I read like four or five pages and just tossed the books. Mm. Um, you know, combined with a lot of gut hunch. Um, I trust my gut. I don't trust it 100%, but I trust it like 95%. So the combination of people wh whose opinions I know and trust with a little bit of research, uh, to comparative shopping, and my own gut, I just, uh, quickly made 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 my choices 
And it's funny, you know, I spend another 300 bucks on a series of webinars on based, centered around the, the theme of how to get your book sold to Hollywood, to a movie, movie or TV producer. Hmm. Um, really, really high quality experts on this. And I know that from, from, uh, you know, from those snooping around. And you know what? I haven't watched a single, single one of the webinars yet. I just haven't had time. It's one of those examples of I spent a little money on something that was worthwhile, but I don't have, I don't have the time, Brad. I only mm. have very limited time. So it's like there are opportunities that could be really good, but you have to make choices right? Uh, and, and really stick with the choices, o- although you have to be uh, fluid because I've, I've, you know, I've, I've adjusted the whole strategy along the way when I've, when I've learned new information. I love that. And and then the other piece, too, that I wanted to call out was just the fact that you were willing to invest in that consultant to cut your learning curve literally from months yeah. to days. And yeah. I think that that's a, a, a pretty important call out because especially I'll use my own uh, circumstances, for example, and I'm just trying to get a, a business off the ground, really. You want to do it all on your own. You don't want to you know, yes. bite the bullet and make that investment. Yeah. But this, what it could save you in time oh. and get you to that point, you know, where you're making your first hundred thousand, ten thousand dollars, yeah, could be invaluable in the long run. Yeah, yes, yeah, so true, so true, and and also to be willing to quickly let go of an investment if it if it's if you if you get feedback pretty quickly in the system that it's not it's not panning out, boom, drop it. Hmm. That, yeah. that's a great call out as well. So we've talked a lot about the lead up to this book and, and how it came to be. Um, but can you give us just a little bit of insight into a, a little bit deeper than just the food and personal development, what the book's about and what oh yeah readers okay. can expect to get out of the book? Sure. Um, yeah. Let me try to do that in a really concise way. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. So as you said, the subtitle is a story of, of loss love and the ingredients of greatness that love is not romantic love it's really the love of uh, a boy and his father uh, of a mentor in his charge uh, it's, it's, it's that it's the story is really about the power of a great mentor and mm-hmm. how how a mentor can transform the life of somebody who's struggling to help them find find their path which is what happens here so the story is a young boy 14 years old He's just lost his dad when the story opens, and he's, his life is struggling. He's going, circling the drain. He's getting in fights at school. He's on the verge of expulsion. He's headed in a bad direction. He crosses paths with a crusty old retired diner chef who he goes to work for for a little bit to, to pay him back for an act of vandalism on his property. And um, so he goes to work in his kitchen, and in the course of that, he starts learning lessons about food, which really turn out to be lessons about, about life. And so in that sense, it's kind of like Karate Kid meets Master Chef. Yeah. Um, and and uh, the, the story is called The Ingredients of Greatness. And the whole idea of it is what goes into really creating um, a, a great life. That's a life, not only a life of, of excellence, but also a meaningful life, a life mm. of purpose. And so that's the, the, it's both the, the boy's journey. And it's also, uh, in a sense, the chef's journey. It's it's the journey of, of the mentor and, and what a great mentor looks like. That's fantastic. I, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to uh, digging into that one. Um, and John, before I let you go, I want to shift gears again back to your own personal story and your own journey. And you've obviously over the years been exposed to a lot of different industries and had, um, I'm sure many mentors of your own and people giving you advice. Is there one piece of advice that stands out that say you could go back in time and give that piece of advice to yourself at age 27, 28? Is there one Mm. piece that you would you would give that young John David man? Oh boy. Yeah, there, there, there certainly is. Um, that's a great question. Hadn't thought about that, but, but I got a quick answer. If I could go back and talk to my 19 or 24 year old self or whatever, in those days, I was both completely sure of myself and had no idea what I was doing. Mm hmm. Um, I didn't, I didn't know I had no idea what I was doing and I 
was totally sure of myself. And I think what I would say, if I could convey this to myself in some way, would be that the secret to success or to successfully negotiating your path in life is to completely trust your gut, um, believe in yourself, have unshakable confidence in your own vision, and don't let anybody else deter you from your path and don't listen to anybody else. And do not trust yourself. Listen to other people. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a total paradox and contradiction because right. the deal of it is you've, you've got to have faith in yourself and, and self-confidence and believe in your own dream, ha follow your passion. At the same time, um, there, there are you know there are plenty of people who will try to give you advice and it's it's bad advice who will try to knock you off your path and you shouldn't listen to them, but there are people around you who know you better than you know yourself. They may be elders, they may not be elders, they may be youngers, they may be contemporaries, they may be anybody, uh, and, and the universe knows you in every way better than you know yourself. So there will you you will be met with clues from your environment. Um, like Bob Berg asking me if I'd write that book with him. I would never have thought of doing that. It was not my plan. It was bothering me. And thank God I did it. It's like that created my career. So you have to be both totally centered in your own self-confidence. And also you have to keep your ears open and eyes open and be willing to take take the, the, the cues and hints from the world around you. So I, I love that advice and I want to go a little bit deeper into it actually because I think that for the, the question it raises for me is how do you know which of those people are those ones that you have to ignore and keep going forward and keep powering through despite what you're being told? How, how do you differentiate that group from the people you actually should be listening to who might have better insights into what you're doing than you, your own what that's your own a journey. Uh, that's a great. That's a really good one because I think that it's and that's a tough one to answer. Um, you know, on the one hand, on an objective level, uh, you know, obviously you want to listen to people who have some kind of qualification. <laughs> sure. You yeah, that makes you sense. You don't want to <laughs> take, take take marital advice from somebody who's been married uh, eight times and miserably every time. That kind of thing. Um, but you know, how do you know if you should listen or not? Uh, you know. I mean, I think you know. You always know, but you don't know that you know. It's mm -hmm. it's like, it's like I think um, developing that intuition, that gut sense, developing so that it's accurate and you know how to read it. I believe takes practice. I mean, I think, think some come to it more naturally than others. My wife comes to it more naturally, I think, than I do. I think she ha she knows she has more practice listening to her gut sense and 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 knowing. Listening to her own, uh, uh, you know what her what her uh, viscera are doing about the situation, than I do. I am have more practice at being uh, led by my 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 thought machine, my brain, mm -hmm. and not listening to my gut. I think it's largely a matter of practice, and so I think the way you develop that is pay attention to what you to what you decided based on your gut or what what your gut was telling you, and what you did, and then what was the result? And over time, you begin to you begin to see, oh man, you know what? I knew that was a bad idea, um, or I knew I should have done that. And over time, it becomes something. That, it's like a skill. It's like a muscular skill. I think. Mm -hmm. I just think it's important. I would have wished that I would have known that and begun listening to it and developing it earlier on. Mm. I, yeah, that's really helpful because you hear that a lot, that listen to your gut, but it's hard to get a grasp on exactly what that yes, means right. and how you develop that. So I, I think that your your guidance there to to really track it and pay attention to when you do listen to it and when yes. you feel like maybe you're doing something against what you deep down think you should be doing and, and trace it to the result because I think that looking back and seeing how it played out is something that a lot of us can easily bypass and, mm -hmm. and don't think to do at all. So that's mm -hmm. really helpful. So John, for anybody who's listening, and I'm sure there's going to be quite a few people who are excited about the recipe and they want to check it out and they want to be able to get their hands on it right when it comes out, where can they find out more about the book or possibly pre-order it or find out more about you? 
So I have a website, johndavidman.com, man with two N's, johndavidman.com. All my books are there. Uh, That's where my blog is. Uh, Basically, information from excerpts, sample chapters, ordering information, everything about every book I've ever done is is there. There's also a a specific page for the pre-order of the book. We do have this special uh, uh, offer going on. A bunch of bonus material that uh, Chef Charles and I got together at his place in Houston and shot a bunch of video of cooking and discussing and interview. And um, that's we're packaging that together as, as a bonus for people who pre-order the book. And that is at theingredientsofgreatness.com. Perfect. And what's the release date on the book again? October 17. Perfect. Well, we will certainly have all those links in the show notes on whatever podcast app you may be listening to this on, folks, and you can find all of the show notes at millennialmm.com forward slash podcast as well. John, thank you so much for connecting. This was an absolute pleasure for me to be able to pick your brain a little bit and get your thoughts on, on all these different topics and to see and hear about the journey that you've been through and how it all has kind of culminated into this one new epic book. And it's a cliffhanger. We don't know how it'll work out. We'll know in October. Yeah. Well, then I think uh, I think once it, it becomes a, a bestseller, even after you went down this new journey of, of self-publishing, I think we're going to have to do a round two to talk about what you learned through the process of, of getting to that success. It works for me. All right. Thanks, John. Thank you so much, Brad. Such a pleasure being here. Hey guys, thank you again for stopping by today to spend a little bit of time with me and the rest of the Millennial Mafia. Just a reminder, you can find all of today's show notes at millennialmm.com forward slash podcast. And if you haven't heard yet, I'm opening up my calendar to you, the listeners, to hop on a 15 minute call with me. The sole purpose of this call is to connect and get to know each other. I want to forge true relationships with you so that we can build up an amazing network and community of ambitious millennials who are going to be the leaders and influencers of tomorrow. If you're interested, please just go to millennialmm.com forward slash call and snag a 15 minute time slot. I look forward to connecting with you. Peace out.